Uh, the title of this message is A Thankful Leper. Uh, Deacon Nate came to me just after seeing the handout and thought it was a thankful loser. And I uh, thought that's got potential as a sermon title, but uh, it's a thankful leper. Sorry, Nate, that's what you, you got to be careful what you tell the preacher. Uh, did everybody get the handout tonight? Is anyone missing it? Everyone's, everyone's got it? Okay. If you're watching the live stream, the handout was attached to the email if you'd like to print it out and follow along. Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse number 11. Let's read these verses and then we'll uh, jump both feet in. Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse number 11. It came to pass that as Jesus went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers. And they stood afar off and they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. If you know anything about leprosy and especially the Bible rules on it, it, it is in fact a contagious disease. It was a very scary one in the ancient world. Uh, it's scary still today. It's mostly eradicated. It only exists in a few places, mostly in uh, uh, northern India. But uh, the Bible had strict quarantine laws for people that were infected with leprosy. They had to stay away. They couldn't go near um, normal society or they couldn't just enter into a crowd. And so these men are not only ill and not only with an incurable disease, but they are outcasts from their communities. They're outcasts from society. But Jesus happens to be going through Samaria. And if you know your Bibles, you know this is a fairly radical thing for Jesus to be doing in the first place. So he's in an outcast place and he has people that are outcasts even there. This is about as far from polite society as it is possible to get. And they stand a great distance away and they shout, they, they together, the 10 of them cry loudly and they say, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. It is just a cry for mercy. Now, Jesus, of course, in verse 14, the Bible tells us that when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves unto the priests. Now you need to know this also about the, the, the Bible that specified, hey, if you have leprosy, you cannot go spread it in, in the community, that if you believe you've been healed, you can't just go back home. If you believe that there's been a miracle, if you believe you've been healed, step one is go show yourself to the priest. The priest had very specific rules on exactly how to check them out to verify if they were clean, if they were safe to re-enter society or not. And so Jesus doesn't promise them anything. Interestingly, he just gives them this command. They've called him master. So he gives them a command and he says, go show yourself to the priests. So it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, there's a sermon right there. Somebody say amen. But that's not my sermon tonight. So, so as they went to obey, they, as they were on their way, they looked down and noticed that the healing had been accomplished. Now, imagine for a moment that's you. You've suffered from this terrible disease and, and you, you, your whole future is now lined out ahead of you you know exactly what's going to happen. It's a progressive disease. It gets worse and worse and worse until it's sufficiently bad that you die. You know you're not going back to your family. You know you're not going back to your friends or your work. You know you are an outcast and here even an outcast among outcasts. But Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And on your way, to re-enter society, to, to regain your life. You're about to get everything that you've lost. You're about to get it back. What's your first reaction? Verse 15 tells us that one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Instead of running to the priest, running to go regain all that has been lost. He turns back. And then with the same loud voice that he had cried out for mercy, he glorifies God. And he falls down, verse 16 tells us, he fell on, on his face at Jesus' feet and he gave him thanks. All right, let's pray tonight. 
God, we just thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture. We thank you for the lessons that are contained herein. God, we pray that you would help us to get a hold of these, not just at an intellectual level, but, Lord, at our heart level, that we would grab a hold of this, God, that you would make us thankful people. Help us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Uh, Amen. The one comes back and says, thank you. And Jesus has a question. Verse 17, Jesus says to the man at his feet, he says, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. It's the Samaritan among the 10. It's the Samaritan that came back to say thank you, which implies that the other ones were natural Jews. So they were So they were still outcasts as lepers, but they were slightly less outcast than the double outcast Samaritan leper. Isn't that funny how even among outcasts, you can develop the rank order of who's more or less outcast. Verse 19, Jesus said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. A few thoughts I'd like to highlight here tonight as we consider this and... um, I'm going to do this very, very quickly for the sake of time, but I believe that if, you'll, if you'd like to fill in these blanks and take a couple notes as we go along, if you'll think about this over the course of the week and as the other pastors build on this foundation here tonight, that, that this will help you uh, not just be more grateful, but will help you have the kind of life that God is calling us to have, and it's a better one. This is a, this, it's a better life. God, God is not, I don't believe, primarily interested in making us thankful people because he's like sitting around in heaven wishing people thanked him more. God knows that thankfulness will change us. That, cha- that thankfulness is more to your benefit, the thanker, than it is to God, the one we thank. A couple things about these 10 men with leprosy, letter A there, I would like to remind you they were all in the same situation. There there was not one of them that was noticeably better or worse than the other. I think about Proverbs 15, 15. I'm reading through Proverbs again with Hugo uh, to, uh, in our evening uh, Bible, our evening devotions. I go into the room and I pick out a proverb with him and we read it and we, we talk about what does it mean. And we, we just a few weeks ago did Proverbs 15, 15. It's one of my favorite Proverbs, partly because I was so confused by it for so long until the light bulb went on. Uh, Proverbs 15, 15, it's there in your outline. It says, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but the he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. <clears throat> and that verse bothered me because it seems to be comparing apples and oranges. It says all the days of the afflicted are evil. So here's a person with affliction and all their days are evil. And, and evil there is just bad. It means all, the, all their days are bad. And that makes sense. If you're dealing with great affliction, every day is kind of a bad day. And then it says, but he that has a merry heart has a continual feast. So it's like, so, so person A is afflicted and every day is bad. And person B has a merry heart and therefore a continual feast. And you say, well, apples and oranges, but not so. Person A, all the days of the afflicted are evil. The only thing we know about person A is that he has affliction. And because that's his defining thing is his affliction, all the days are bad. The only thing we know about person B is he has a merry heart. We don't know anything about his circumstances, but because he has a merry heart, every day's a feast. And I think there's a really important truth here. One person defined by their situation, the other defined by their attitude. What defines you? Is it your affliction? Is it the circumstance that you have found yourself in? Or is it your heart's condition? Which one is the defining characteristic of your life? These 10 men are not that nine had one reaction and the 10th had a different reaction, not because of a difference in their circumstances. They all had the same circumstances. They all had the same situation. They have more in common than just that letter B. They have the same request and they receive the same miracle. In fact, they, they together make the request. They together receive the miracle. I mean, the Bible is really driving home this point for us. I believe that the, the outcome, the, the difference in the final state of the men did not have to do with their situation. It did not have to do with the way they made the request. It did not have to do with the nature of the miracle they received. It was the same in all cases. Psalm 34, 4, the psalmist says, I sought the Lord and, and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. God, God does not play favorites. 
Sometimes we think that he does. We compare our circumstances or our situation to somebody else's and we think God must like them better, but that is not true. That's not how the Lord operates. So even though it's the same circumstances and the same request and the same miracle, there is, in fact, let her see a different response. Verse 15 tells us that one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Again, I would point you to the fact that it's not the circumstances that drive actually our responses. It's what's going on inside of us. Is it a merry heart? Is it a, is it a thankful heart? <clears throat> In Luke 6, 45, Jesus taught us, he said, that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For it's out of the abundance of the heart that his mouth speaketh. And I don't know about you, but I am very prone when I do something wrong or say something wrong to excuse it like this. Well, that wasn't me. That wasn't like me. I'm not normally that way. Or I didn't mean that. And I, as I'm saying those things, believe them to be true. <laughs> the problem is like, well, if that wasn't me, who was it, do you think? The problem is, it's like, it, the more accurate thing would be, I don't want to be that way. I don't, I don't desire to be that guy. And I'm super bummed out that when pushed, I can be. The problem is that when you squeeze something, you find out what's inside. I, I like to say like, well, it was the stress or the pressure or the surprise. But like, if you squeeze an orange, you're going to get what's inside of it. And when I get squeezed, unfortunately, what comes out is not always what I wish would come out but it's coming out of my heart. And it doesn't do us any good to pretend that that's not what was in there. And then I'd like to say this also, besides the different response, I'd like to ask you a question tonight. And I believe because Jesus asked this question, of course, anytime Jesus asks a question, it ought to ping your radar because he already knows all the answers. Jesus is not asking this question for information. It's not like one comes back and Jesus goes, boy, I really thought there were going to be 10. What happened? That, right, you understand that Jesus is not confused as he asks this question. Jesus will wear the nine. They are not found that return to give glory to God except this stranger. And he said unto him, so he speaks now to the Samaritan former leper. And he says, arise and go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. Can I, can I ask you a, an interesting question? I, I hope this will be a thought-provoking question tonight. What mattered more in the long run? Being cured of leprosy or this one sentence of theological instruction from Jesus. You see, well, the, well, the one that was grateful and the, one that, the nine that were not grateful all got healed. True. But they all eventually died. You know how I know that? None of them are around today. Jesus healed them of the leprosy, but... They, he didn't heal them of their mortality. But this guy got a secret, if you will. It's not a secret. Jesus spent his whole ministry preaching and demonstrating exactly this. Thy faith has made thee whole. Mark 8, 36, Jesus asks a similar question. He says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And loses his own soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I'll tell you, it's better to have leprosy and go to heaven than to live a perfectly healthy life and die and go to hell. And, and the Bible does, we, we just, we get this briefest of snapshots into this miracle. But I'll tell you that the leper that was grateful heard from the mouth of Jesus the connection between faith and being made whole. The other nine, we don't know what they believed about their miracle. Maybe they thought it was because they asked in the right way and therefore they were made whole. Maybe they thought it was just because they were in the right place at the right time that they were made whole. Maybe, who knows what it is that they thought. Maybe they were so excited to get healed that they just went on with their lives and just immediately forgot how desperate they were. None of you have ever done that. Been so desperate for God to do something and then when he does it, you immediately move on with your life like nothing happened. No one here is guilty of that, I'm sure. Just your pastor? Okay, and a couple deacons. <laughs> but this guy, because of his gratitude, learns the source of actual wholeness, and that's faith in God. 
I believe that this is a powerful lesson for others. Jesus, of course, he's asking the question of the man that's thankful, not for his benefit or for Christ's benefit. He's teaching the people that are around him. He's, he's highlighting what has just happened to all the observers who've just witnessed this miracle. He wants them to get the lesson, these other people that are following Jesus. And it's a truth for eternity that this man has received. It's not, it's not a healing for a moment or a healing for a lifetime. It's a truth for eternity. Romans 4 says, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, the reward's not reckoned of grace, but debt. If you can earn it, God owes it to you. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The Bible says there's two ways you can be righteous. One, you can actually go be righteous. And good luck with that. Or you can take Abraham's approach and just believe God. And then God will take that belief and he'll count it as if it was righteousness. Between you and me, may I suggest to you, that is a much better way. But it's foreign to human thinking. We, we, we are not naturally inclined to think that we could be righteous by faith because we're not actually righteous. And it seems incredible that God would look on faith and write it in his book as righteousness. It seems incredible. And until you start to understand Christ and what he accomplished on the cross and how we can be placed in Christ by faith and therefore have Christ's righteousness applied to us, this is a big concept. It's the, it's the defining idea in many ways of Christianity. But it's an odd concept to think of faith as the method of actually becoming righteous in God's sight. And so I do not think at all likely that the nine made this connection. The nine lepers, I don't know that they connected their wholeness to faith. It's a, it's a deeply counterintuitive idea. Every religion in the world has exactly the opposite idea of this. Every religion, every philosophy in the world says, if you want to be good, do good. If you want to be okay with God, do right. Could I say do right? Please do right. Do what's good. But that's not how you get right with God. You... And so this idea of faith towards righteousness is something we need teaching on. Even as David, the Bible says, describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Boy, it would be blessed to not have any sins. It would be blessed to not have any iniquities. But even David, a man after God's own heart, he was involved in murder and adultery and all kinds of pride and sins of self-will. And he said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where the blessing is. It, the blessing is getting those sins forgiven, to have that iniquity covered. That's where the blessedness is. And only the grateful leper got to hear from the mouths of Jesus, from the mouth of Jesus, this incredible truth. So thankfulness has more to do with your and my benefit than with anything that God is like sitting in heaven hoping to get a thank you note. And I've seen in my life over and over again, one of the reasons you've maybe picked up on this that I am passionate about this subject is because through very difficult things, things in my life that are, they were so hard, I do not know if, if I could have survived them and certainly not survived them with a, with a joyful experience. And I'm broadly a joyful person. I, I feel like I broadly have a continual feast. And, but, but the reason for that is because the Lord has taught me to be grateful and thankful just all the time. And, and the thankfulness does not come because Evangeline got better. The thankfulness does not come because my life got easier or because I got a day off or because I got a vacation. Because often those things are not true or the opposite is true. Evangeline mostly year over year has gotten worse and that worse and worse. But that's not what determines how my life is going. It's not my circumstances that decide how I feel about this life that God's given me. There's a fountain inside. And it just spits out joy. And it's, I believe the key to opening that fountain of joy in your life, as it was in mine, 
as the Bible teaches us, it's thankfulness. That's why the devil is so determined, I think, to rob Christians of just being thankful. It seems like such a simple thing, and it is staggering to me, sometimes even how few Christians have like a consistent attitude of thankfulness because for such a simple thing, you can unlock so much in your life and put yourself in the position at the feet of Jesus where you get that word that's going to make the eternal difference. Because thankfulness will put you at the feet of Jesus. And can I just say to you, Christian, can we agree that at the feet of Jesus is really where you want to be? Amen. And nothing will put you there faster than just wanting to go there to say thanks. Not uh, Most of the time when I'm, I, I will tell you, most of my prayer time, that, that's like my prayer time. I spend a lot of time praying for all of y'all. <laughs> right? Now, that's not good English, but that is what happens. It's all y'all. And, and, I, and I love to do that. I love to pray for you, and you're on my prayer list, and the church prayer list, and that's all fine. But I'm, when I'm praying for me, over half of it's just Thanksgiving. It's just Thanksgiving. I, I often will go down to pray and not get out of the Thanksgiving part of it. I will not even get to my time of making requests when it's my stuff. Because I have so much to be thankful for. And, and I just find that, that I get up from Jesus' feet, having been, been gone there to be, just say thank you, not ask for anything, just thank you, and get up having heard a word from the Lord. Not audibly, but you understand. The Lord just does something for me, and I want that for you. A couple quick lessons from this text on having a fountain of thankfulness. Letter A, thankfulness flows from the heart, not from the circumstances. And I've, I've preached that, I think, already, but I just would like you to remind you that if you're going to be thankful, do not wait for your circumstances to produce thankfulness. That, that will not fail unless you just get to move to Mexico and live on the beach and have somebody just bring you drinks. I mean, but even then, you can find grouchy people. You can find grouchy people on the beach. Because all oh, the wind's too strong, or oh, they didn't make my drink right, or whatever, right? And it's just like, do you know where you are? There are people shoveling snow right now, right? Do not wait for your circumstances to make you a thankful person. That's not where it comes from. It comes from the heart. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but that he is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. What defines your life? Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What's going on in your heart? You, you cannot, there's very little you can do to control your circumstances. But you can guard your heart and say, what's going on down there? And that keep there is literally to put a guard on. Put a guard on your heart. And if it's getting less thankful, tell the guards to start shooting stuff. Thankfulness Letter B flows from humble expectations. I do not think it is a coincidence that the one leper that was thankful was the Samaritan. Because you know why? I think he expected less. I think he expected less. And that put him in a good position to be thankful. Obviously, Jesus isn't racist. He he knows that we're all cousins. He knows we're all descendants of Adam. We're all descendants of Noah. So why is the Bible bothering? Why does Jesus say, and this guy's a Samaritan? Why does Jesus point out his ethnic background? Because Samaritans did not expect good things, and especially not from the Jews. It would have been reasonable for this Samaritan leper to expect Jesus to heal the nine Jews and leave him alone. There's a very strong likelihood, I would suggest to you, that this leper that this Samaritan leper in their group of 10, that as they're going to see Jesus, the Jewish preacher, that he had the idea, there's at least a chance that Jesus is going to heal the nine and I'm going to get left out. Because the Samaritans are used to getting left out by the Jews. And so when he's not left out, when he's included in the miracle, when he finds himself included in the grace of God, and finds fertile ground in his heart to just be so grateful that he got included. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't care about your ethnic background. The part that matters is that we're sinners. And the Bible says that while you were still a sinner, God loved you. If that doesn't find fertile ground in our hearts for gratitude, something's wrong. That God would include sinners. That God would include a sinner like me in his grace I will never, never get over it. Not after 10 billion years in heaven will I get over the fact that God was willing to include me. <clears throat> if a person expects more than they receive, 
they're excited. Or if a person receives more than they expect, they're excited. But if a person expects more than they actually receive, they're disappointed. But it doesn't actually have to do with how much you received. It has to do with how much you expected. Isn't that interesting? If you're expecting $20 and get 10, you're disappointed. If you're expecting no dollars and get 10, you're excited. It's $10, but your reaction is different, not based on the $10. Your reaction is different based on what you expected. What do you expect? Something that might be handicapping the thankfulness in your life might be expectations that are out of line. I I see that particularly affecting our young people today where they just, they've been taught that they should expect all these things. And then no matter how good life is, if it's not like the Instagram people, if it's not like the people on TV, if their life's not like the celebrities, they feel like they've been cheated somehow. Like they're, they're, they are, they look at their lives and they are deeply disappointed with their lives. But not because their lives are empirically bad, not compared to so many in the world who don't know if they're going to have food tomorrow. So why are they so, why, why are they so well off and so disappointed with their lives? I'd suggest you has mostly to do with expectations. It's easier to see in others than it is to see in ourselves. But I'll tell you, I I expected a healthy kid. I expected a healthy kid. Why? Because I signed a contract when we got pregnant. And the deal was, if I do these things, I therefore get a healthy kid. But I expected it. I expected that we were going to, that Christmas was going to look a certain way. I expected that birthdays and holidays were going to look a certain way. I expected family reunions and things to look a certain way. And when they were not that way, I was deeply, deeply disappointed. It was like going through a death, the death of all those expectations. And and you go into grief and mourning even over things that were never promised, but that we expected. But humble expectations... Once God finally broke me of that, and I no longer even expected one more day with my daughter, then every day became a gift. Every single day now is a gift. And some of them are very hard, but I don't expect to get it. I don't expect to get it. I thought that when I made peace with God over Evangeline dying, I genuinely believed that she was going to die that week. I really thought she was. I believed that God was waiting for me to be okay and then she was going to die. And so when I finally said, okay, God, if you kill her, if you take her, then I'm, I'm going to stick with you. And I thought, now she's going to die. And she didn't. And that day was a gift. And the next one was a gift. And the next one was a gift. And I went from fighting God every day to getting a gift every day. And God didn't change. And my circumstance didn't change. All that changed was my expectations. And I want that for you because it's good because every day is a gift and thankfulness, that fountain of thankfulness flows out of what you expect. Thirdly, thankfulness flows out of a focus on eternity. So thankfulness is from your heart, not your circumstances. And it's more to do in your heart has mostly to do with what you expect or don't expect. And I'll tell you, if you can get that heart focus onto eternity rather than what's comfortable here and now, you can have a fountain of thankfulness as you look at eternity. I was talking to Sandy Fulton on the phone today, and and she, the last three years have been very, very hard for her, and it's been exceedingly, exceedingly difficult. And we were talking with each other and praying a little bit, and, and just one of the things that I was reminded of, of just even talking to her today is that through those difficulties, the Lord has prepared her to be able to minister to people that I could not minister to. Because I don't know what it's like to be trapped at home and unable to go places and do things and to be forgotten about by people. But she does know what that's like. And so now she's equipped to minister to these people. With, with Evangeline, I just, I never, I, I, 
I never disliked disabled people. I was nervous around them. Like you, you'd see somebody disabled at the mall or, or out and about, and like, I wanted to do something nice. I wanted to like say hi, but I like, wasn't sure if it was offensive or you know, if I was going to talk in the wrong voice or if I was going like, to make some huge faux pas. And so it's all just like awkward and weird around, around disabled folks. You know? And God's cured me of that, praise the Lord. Like, now I know what to do, right? But it comes out of some of these very difficult things when you start to think less about how uncomfortable and how difficult and how much suffering this is to how is God going to use this to minister to some people that otherwise could not be reached, that otherwise I'd been unable to help. And you say, whoa, God's doing something for eternal value out of temporary suffering. It's frankly a good trade. This leper, could I suggest to you an interesting thought? What if this man had never gotten leprosy? Would he have still met Jesus? I don't know that that's at all certain that he would have. He wouldn't have gotten to experience Jesus' miracle power in his life if there had never been something that needed the miracle power of God. What if the things that we saw in our lives that were so terrible, what if instead we viewed those as opportunities to experience the work of God, to participate in his ministry for something of eternal weight and value? It might change the way we felt about our circumstances. Instead of just being, oh, I'm so afflicted with a special needs daughter, it's a privilege. You often hear me say that I have the privilege of being the father to a special needs girl. And I am telling you, I genuinely feel that way about it. My daughter is not a burden. She's an incredible blessing. Well, Heaven and I have talked about like that if she just were like immediately healed, which we pray for, and, and you should keep praying for that too. But I'm telling you, if she were immediately healed, there are things I would miss. There are things I would miss. Because some of these things out of, out of the deep, hard things, come some really beautiful, really special, wonderful things. And if, that, if I can see that even a little bit in this life, what's it going to be like on the other side of the river? When we actually get there and you can finally see the whole picture, man, Christian, if we could just believe for a moment that on the other side into eternity, these things that God's redeeming them for something, then you can, be, then you can start to actually be thankful for it. That's what 2 Corinthians 4 says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, written by a man stoned to death, shipwrecked, burned, left for dead, and in prison while writing this. It says our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. Because the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So how do we actually do this? The final thoughts tonight as we come down the home stretch. How do we actually be thankful? I'd like to suggest to you that like anything that's worth doing, it requires a little bit of discipline. Boo, everybody said to the preacher. <laughs> it requires, listen, if, you, if you're just like, oh, you want to be thankful because it's not going to come from your circumstances. It's going to come from a changed heart and a heart that's changed to look more at eternity. And that's not going to happen because the preacher yelled at you on a Wednesday night. I mean, I wish, right? Somebody say amen. How do we actually get into the discipline of thankfulness? I have just quickly five thoughts for you, and I'm going to do these very quickly. Uh, letter A, that's a typo on the screen. Letter A, decide to be a grateful person. I, I, I believe in this. I believe you could decide to be a grateful person. D don't, don't sit waiting for God to zap you with thankfulness lightning. Right? That one day you're just going to, oh, I feel so grateful. Probably not. Decide. Do, do, do you want to be a grateful person, yes or no? Do you want your life characterized by your circumstances or by your heart's response to whatever happens? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How many of you does that sound like a commandment to? It says, In everything give thanks. Okay? Does God command us to do anything that is impossible then for us to do with his help? No. If God commands you to do it, God will help you do it. So if God says in everything give thanks, you can be certain God will help you to be thankful in a circumstance. If you're in a circumstance, you say, God, I cannot be thankful in this circumstance. God, would you help me be thankful? The answer is yes. On the authority of the word of God, Jesus said, do this. So if you say, help me do it, the answer is yes. 
God will help you be thankful. And I have experienced this over and over in unbelievably terrible circumstances. We, Heather and I, we, this is our habit now. We go to the emergency room and we're there and it's two in the morning and probably a holiday because that's when you go. <laughs> and I've spent so many Christmas Eves and Christmases and just major holidays in the hospital. We spent the whole month of July there once and watched the fireworks out the window. And I'm telling you, like, we're there. And, and one of the things that we have learned to do is pretty quickly, we turn to each other and we say, okay, what are the things we're grateful for? And it's not a game. We're serious about it. And we start making the list. And you know what? It doesn't take very long to have a pretty big list. It's surprising, even in some of the worst circumstances you can imagine. If you say, God, we want to be thankful, help us. You're going to come up with a list, and guess what? Everything gets better. Continual feast, independent of what's going on. Don't let your circumstances control your attitude. Letter B, and, and I just alluded to this here, how's you do it? You look for the good. You decide you're going to be grateful, and then you look. You look for the good things. You say, this is pretty terrible. Easy to make a list of the terrible things. Everybody knows that. Bored. Look for the good things. What are the good things here? And we just start thinking, we, we were, boy, we came back from our vacation. We, we decided we're going to try to take family vacations. I know I'm running out of time, but we're just like, we quit taking vacations. We, we did our last one. We tried a couple times with Evangeline and every time was progressively more difficult and, and everybody got sick and she didn't have that good of a time. It was just terrible. And we just said no more. And so for years, we didn't travel at all. And then Hugo's getting older and we started thinking, we... We feel like we're robbing him of like, because he just like wants to travel. He's interested in all the places. And we're like, okay, we just don't feel good about just leaving Evangeline behind for this. We're like, we're just going to put on our big boy pants and we're going to go try. And we're going to like try to have a family vacation again. And so, so we do, we go to the Great Wolf Lodge and it was like, okay, but she inhaled a bunch of water and got two rounds of pneumonia and her oxygen levels were dropping down into brain damage territory. And we're like trying to get home to the hospitals and the oxygen tanks all the way from over on the other side of the state. And like, I I could tell you a whole list of things that went super wrong with that trip. But on the drive home, we were making the lists of things that we were grateful for. That we had oxygen tanks with us so that we could keep our O2 up in the car. That we had good relations with the doctors and things at home so we could make those phone calls and they would believe us and just get us right in and get us started on the things that we needed to do. And we were grateful for the couple of good days that we had and for the good memories that we made and the good pictures that we took. And we were, we we're just like, I'm telling you, you started to make the list. And my memories of that vacation now are mostly positive because we decided to look for the good things and we hang on to those. I'll tell you one thing that Evangeline has taught me. Oh man, it's a lot. But so every night I drive her, she has a very hard time going to sleep. And, and so we put her in the car and I go out in the, in the country and I drive around and, uh, and she wants to tell stories. She wants to tell stories. And so she signs to me in the back seat. It's very difficult in the dark. And if you see me on the road at night, just look out because I'm half the time I'm looking over my shoulder like this. I drive out way in the country. So it's the deer in more danger than you are. But, and the story she wants to tell, she tells stories about when she got to go on Auntie Misty's tire swing like six years ago. And we tell that story almost every night. She talks about her cousin's birthday party when they had the sparkle candles. And I don't know if, I don't know, I'm not beating up on Charlotte, but I don't know if she remembers that. But Evangeline does. Because she retells that story. And the, I know that Aunt Misty served mint ice cream cake. You know how I remember that? Because we tell that story because it was good cake. And Evangeline wants to retell that story over and over again. She tells about how she got the blood draws or she got the nose swabs or she got an IV. But those stories always end with who she told and how proud they were of her. And so, yeah, she knows that she got the IV. She knows she got the blood draw. She knows she got the nose swab. But the part that she's excited about that story is the people in her life that were proud of her. So what are the things that are going on in your life, but what's the part of that story that's highlighted? Look for the good things. Philippians says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. There's plenty of garbage and bad stuff that happens, but what do you dwell on? What are the stories you tell over and over again? Remember the blessings. Remember the blessings. Write them down. 
I don't want to say too much about this. Pastor Jamie's going to give us a sermon on this in a couple of weeks. We are programmed, uh, human nature is programmed to remember the things that went wrong and forget the good things. We got to change that. Take a lesson from Evangeline tonight. Remember what the good things were and retell those stories in your mind. This will work. This will help your relationships. It'll help your friendships. If like, don't retell the stories of that one time they wronged you. Retell the stories of all the times they went out of their way to help you. Retell the sto stories in your mind of all the times they were good to you and that they were kind to you. Retell those stories when you think about that person, not that one time that they were a jerk. Consider starting a thankfulness journal. Letter D, and Pastor Jamie will hit you harder on that in a couple weeks. D, make time for thankfulness. I've always believed in this, but it's been a difficult season in church. The last couple of years were really hard on pastors all over. It was very difficult on me. Lots of hard things happened in public and behind the scenes. Um, and one of the disciplines I, I started and I, I ramped it up recently is making time for thankfulness. I'll tell you, I started doing this probably four days a week. I, I nuke a little sausage. I got a Jimmy Dean sausage and I'll nuke one or two of them. Healthy breakfast, the breakfast of champions, Jimmy Dean sausage. And I'll take those and I'll go out on my deck, even though it's cold or, you know, in the summer when it's a little warm, I, I go out there first thing in the morning and I leave my phone and everything inside. I go, I go away from all the electronics and I go out there with my Jimmy Dean sausage and a cup of coffee. And my only agenda is to make a list of things I'm thankful for. And I don't have any time limit on it. I just go out there and I eat my sausages. And the dogs know they're going to get some, so they're right there. I know what they're grateful for. And I just make a list. I just sit there and I make a list. I think of all the things I'm thankful for. And life's been really hard and I've been super busy. But I'll tell you, my mental health has been really, really good lately because four days out of the week at least, five days out of the week, I start my day with just this huge list of things that I am so grateful for. And it's just hard, it's just hard, to, it's hard to be grouchy when you're as blessed as I am. I'm an overwhelmingly blessed person. I just, I feel really deeply how incredibly, incredibly blessed I am. And it's just nice just to have a couple of minutes. Like I said, I don't have a watch or a clock. I don't know what time, how long I spend on it. It's not long. But it's nice just to check in with God and say, hey, I noticed all these things and I just wanted to say thanks. Psalms 100, enter into his gates of thanksgiving into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name because the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth all generations. There's a lot to be thankful for. And then finally, I think one of the disciplines of thankfulness is find somebody else to bless. Especially when you start to really feel blessed, you're going to want to just like do something for somebody else. And there's, there's very little in this life that will make you feel more thankful than going out of your way to be good to somebody else. It's just like, we, we, I remember earlier on, and I wasn't a pastor yet or anything, and Evangelion was early, still sick. And, and we just like, I remember feeling like Heather and I were feeling kind of forgotten a little bit or overlooked maybe on stuff. And, and we were kind of like, you know, oh, it's been so long since anybody brought us any food or did anything to help us. And, you know, because when a crisis first breaks out, there's like food and things. And then as the crisis drags on and turns into your whole life as a crisis, people stop coming by with casserole, right? You know, or they're not sure, you know, and, and, and in their defense, they're not sure if they should or if they're meddling or whatever. Like this is not, I'm just saying you can start to feel sorry for yourself. Somebody say amen so I don't feel so guilty. Okay. So we're just kind of feeling like, poor us, you know. And so, you know what we did? This is Heather's idea. She's like, you know who else is having a hard time? There's a family called the Darjanis. She's the Darjanis are having a hard time. It's been a long time since we took them food. So we went and we got some stuff that we knew they could eat, which, you know, the special diets because they had a special needs kid too and, and all that sort of stuff. And so we, and Heather, we, and then we started having fun, picking out some, bath salts for Mrs. Darjani and meat for Mr. Darjani and some toys that we knew the kids would like. And we just, you know, we, we only intended to bring them food, but it turned into like a fun little thing. And then we went to their house and rang the doorbell and they were so excited. And it was, and we just visited them with them for a couple of minutes. And we went home, I think, more blessed than they did. It was just because we just decided rather than sit at home and feel sorry for ourselves that we just try to go bless somebody else. And that's one of the disciplines I think of thankfulness is just to 
eyes off yourself a little bit less. Just think about other people and it'll remind you all the stuff you have to be grateful. Because we left their house and felt pretty good about, they had some problems that we don't have, praise God. <laughs> we thought, hey, could be worse. Galatians 6, 2. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So give thanks. That's the, that's the, theory, the theme for this whole month. It's 8.02. I'm going to call that finishing on time. Uh, thank, you for bearing with, thank you for bearing with me on this. And I, as, as I'm sure you can tell, this, this has been such a thing for me. And that, that, merry, that continual feast that comes from a merry heart is it 100% a real thing. And I want that as your pastor, as your friend. I want that for you. I believe that if you'll try this, it really does work. And I mean, God's word says so. Don't take my word for it. But, but give it a shot. I dare you. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you for your word and, God, for just this admonition about thankfulness. God, I pray that, that like, the, like that 10th leper, God, that we would not let our circumstances be the thing that controls our gratitude, Lord, that we would have thankfulness as, as what's in our hearts. Lord, we recognize that's going to mean we're going to have to change our perspective some, adjust our expectations maybe. Lord, uh, maybe we're going to have to make some decisions exercise a little discipline to work towards being thankfulness. But God, I pray that you'd help us to do it. Lord, I, I know that I am nowhere close to having arrived on this. I, God, I pray you'd make me a, a more thankful pastor and a more thankful husband and a more thankful father. Lord, we know that you are so worthy of our praise and our gratitude. So we pray that you'd help us to be grateful people. God, just even for our own benefit. Thank you for all that you've done for us and how richly, richly you've blessed us. God, we don't love you half as well as we ought to or say thank you nearly as much as we should. But tonight, God, we would like to say that we love you and thank you for all that you've done for us. And we just uh, submit this prayer in Jesus' name. Uh, amen.